Coming up, my head becomes fashionable. Let's talk about my hat for a minute. We smoke up the Alpina. <clears throat> and the test drive ends well. We have a knock. Buenos dias and welcome to the seventh installment of Project Chicago. Over the last few episodes, we fully rebuilt this engine, put it back in, and then in the previous one, we started it. It sounds glorious, it works glorious, I'm happy, you're happy, everybody's happy. However, there is one slight issue. The engine takes a bit longer now to start. You might have noticed the long crank thing in the previous episode when the engine was still warm and we replaced the oil. Now we're gonna troubleshoot that and once we figure it out, we're gonna prepare it for its first drive down the Autobahn. The engine is brand new. We need to take it for a test drive, see how it feels, break it in. And I'm actually quite excited for that, so let's dive in. All right, my friends, I've been struggling like crazy to figure out what the issue is with the car, with the long cranking and then eventually starting. So it happens pretty much all the time. If the car sits overnight and I come in the morning, it's completely cold. I press the button, it takes about five to 10 seconds for it to start and it's a really rough start. It sputters into life and then it works perfectly fine. Then if I try to restart it immediately, it starts brilliantly, no issues whatsoever, it starts within a second. But if I leave it to sit for about 15 minutes or so and then try to press the button, same deal. Cranks for a very long time and then eventually starts. So I started suspecting something with the fuel pressure. So my first uh, task was to test the fuel pressure at the rail. There's a valve here, so I connected the fuel pressure gauge and I can build fuel pressure with my laptop, 3.5 bar. And according to BMW repair manual, it should stay around that number for extended period of time. And if it drops below more than 0.2 bar, then we have an issue. And it did drop to about 2.8 within like five minutes or so. So next thing I did is I clamped off this feed hose here and this fuel rail doesn't have a return. So the return line is actually in the fuel filter. So I clamped it off here and basically made a closed circuit and the uh, fuel pressure would still drop. So that pretty much told me that we have an issue here and most likely with the fuel injectors. So what I did now is I removed bank two fuel rail and I build fuel pressure with my laptop, 3.5 bar. And then I wiped clean the tips of the fuel injectors with a clean paper towel. And now if I take this dry paper towel, this, oh, I mean, look at that, you can already see that they're dripping like crazy. So if I take this clean paper towel and I put it on the tip of the fuel injector, they are leaking, all of them. Every single one injector is leaking, at least on this rail here. So they are leaking ever so slightly, not a lot to the point where they will lock up the engine, thankfully. But obviously when the car sits for 20 minutes, this is gonna fill up the combustion chamber and it's gonna be flooded and it's gonna sputter until it cleans up all of that and then eventually starts. And there is also a small puff of smoke coming out of the exhaust that smells fuelish like. So this is the issue. The injectors that I sent for cleaning were fine when they were tested. But as the car was running, I guess they didn't like that cleaning and now they're ruined because evidently they are leaking. To be honest, in the first place, I'm not a big fan of cleaning fuel injectors. Whenever I see an opportunity to buy new ones, for example, like on E31, new injectors are 350 euro for all 12 of them. No brainer, buy them brand new. On the E60 M5, all 10 injectors, I bought them brand new because also didn't want to mess around with cleaning. I think they were around 400, 500 euro, original Bosch buy it brand new, done. But on this particular engine, the main reason why I sent the fuel injectors for cleaning is I wanted to be sure that they're good. Look, it's leaking even right now, that they're good, that they're not gonna, not gonna do any damage to the brand new engine. And brand new ones, they cost 200 euros each, times eight, 1,600 euro. So that's why I sent them for cleaning, thought that's gonna be better, I'm gonna know that they're good, I'm gonna have results and whatever. And obviously they worked fine on the first start, but as they started working more and more, on the second start, I started having issue with these. So I'm gonna go and see what's the best price I can get for these injectors. Now I'm gonna start pulling out the old injectors. Pull up. There we are. Say hello to brand new fuel injectors. I was wrong, they're not 200 euros each, they're around 140. And Daniel from Auto House Melkos again made me a nice offer and I paid 962 euros for eight of these, which is still absurdly expensive, but what can you do? 
These are Siemens fuel injectors, which I absolutely hate now. And I did try to find them as aftermarket OE, no dice. These are Alpina specific and you can only get them from the dealer. So let's put them in and hopefully this fixes our issue. A little bit of lubrication. Very good. All right, let's pop them in. Okay. So now it's just a matter of putting everything back together. All these wires and stuff. All right, now we can fire up the laptop. First, we're gonna clear all of the codes and then we're gonna reset the Valtronic adaptations. Continue. That's it. Now we're gonna manually run the fuel pump and you can build fuel pressure. There it is. Now we're gonna start it again. I'm not sure if it's gonna start properly from the first try because there's probably some residual fuel in the cylinders, but let's see. All right, it started a lot quicker. It was running a bit rough for a couple of seconds. Probably burning off all of that fuel and getting used to life again. So now I'm gonna let it run for a little while get it nice and warm. Then we're gonna shut it down, wait 20 minutes, and then try to start it again before it would take five to 10 seconds of cranking before it starts. But if now it starts immediately, then we know that the issue is solved. Alrighty, it's been 25 minutes. Let's see what it says now. Oh yes. She's back. Really nice. By the way, I'm never ever again sending these modern, newer type of fuel injectors for cleaning. They just don't like it. And thankfully we caught this in time. If I actually went for a test drive with leaking injectors, it would destroy this brand new engine. It would wash out the cylinders, score them, melt the pistons, lock up the engine. It would just be a huge disaster. So it's just not worth taking that risk. It's a brand new day. Let's hear that cold start. Oh yes, that is a lovely cold start. No smoke, just sounds good. So the long crank issue has officially been resolved. Also off camera, I replaced the oil because that oil was contaminated with fuel from the leaking injectors. So we have fresh oil in it. And now we're gonna do the front end of the car. In this massive box is the shroud thing support for the oil cooler. I had to wait for two weeks to get this part. 150 bucks. Well, European shillings. Fancy piece of plastic. Of course, he has stamped Alpina on the side, just so you know it's for the Alpina. Is there anything else in there? Chocolate, maybe? No? Surely this is going to be fun, surely. Let's start by removing this thing here. I think I'm not gonna have to remove the intercooler because if I do, I'm gonna lose it. Oh. Whoa, we'll need to disconnect the power string cooler. It looks kinda, well, not pretty. And I did want to buy a new one, but of course it's Alpina specific and it costs million euros, so I didn't. Plug it, plug it, plug it quickly. Yes. I think we should be able to swing it out of the way now. Oh, how do we get to you, sir? Well, scheisse, man. Okay, Brozif, we're gonna remove the headlight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think if I loosen this clamp here, I might be able to pull it ever so slightly. Yes! That's all of the screws on this side. See? Completamente loose. Did I, I, I did miss one more. Ah, that's all of the screws removed. Oh! Expertly done. Lovely. So that's what's left of the old bracketry. Here's the new one. Slide in the condenser. 
Why no sliding action? All right, I'll be back. <clears throat> I'll need to shave that off. Perfect. A few filing moments later. Do we have fitment now? I'm not in the mood for more filing. Fit. I know, we'll use force. There you go. That's fitment. <laughs> I need three hands now. Oh. Slide. Yes. Look at that. It fits. Oh, I see. They didn't leave holes here. What? They didn't drill the holes here. Well, there you have it. You pay 150 European shillings for a piece of plastic from Upina. And they can't even bother to drill the holes here. I mean, what's up with that? That's worth at least 20 euros off. Anyway. All right, let's see how the cooler attaches now. It appears we need bolts. Well, that's bigger than 10. What? It's 11. I don't think I ever used 11 socket in my life. Beautiful. That's lovely and firmly in place. That's clean. So now we need to drill some holes. Because of peanut. Oh no, my drill can't reach. So I'm gonna use a self-tapper to get the hole going. And that's both of them in place. Time to reinstall the headlight and we're gonna be back here in the next episode because we gotta install brand new European headlights. Then we'll do a spot of cleaning as well, of course. The front bumper support. How am I gonna remember where what goes? Where does, what's that? I think this contraption goes in first. I don't remember, it was many moons ago. Okay. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> ripped the glove. You piece of engineering marvel. Oh, oh, oh. I'm missing the thing here, where is it? Ha, found it. I was wondering where that goes. Oh, what a fitment this is. <clears throat> okay, what's, what's going on? Let's just do that later. Oh, I see. Wrong goal. Oh, the headlight really should be removed for this. But force will do. <laughs> Look at that. Actually, espérate. So this needs to go in here. Yes. A little bit of kung fu fighting. Give it a nice twist. There are these covers and a couple of more bolts that go in the back. But we're gonna do that later because the headlights and the bumper need to come out anyway in the next episode. So I'm not gonna bother with that now. It's through, nice. The headlight washers. That's the front bumper carrier installed. What's up? You're hungry. Sure. Sausage. I'll take sausage. Okay. Thank you very much. Deliciously crispy Alpina bumper going back. But hey, it's not cracked anywhere on the inside. It hasn't been patched, anything like that. Uno, dos, tres. Blah, 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 blah. Zwei bolts here. And just like that, it has a face again. I'm gonna quickly throw in the brake ducting. All right, with that, now I can start doing the suspension. Suspension time. If you remember from the inspection video, lower control arms in the front are shot, both control arms in the back are shot as well, ball joints have a ton of play, sway bar links are shot, and well added, we're gonna do sway bar bushings. And these are all OE Lenforda parts. Made in Deutschland. So, you need magic beans to open the wheel caps. No, you need a la Javis to do that. <laughs> the tires are brand new. The only annoying thing is the front are continental and the back is Michelin.
We're gonna start with the control arms first. First the ball joint, breaker bar. <clears throat> The bushing side is already loose. I did that when we were removing the subframe. So the ball joint is not that great either. So the bushing is completely shot, most likely original control arm. This is how a fresh ball joint should be. Nice and firm. So the bushing bolt, as always, just finger tight. Then we're gonna lower the car on the ground, drive it back and forth, and do the final torque. If you torque it all the way now, this bushing is gonna twist when you lower the suspension down, and it's gonna wear out really quickly. So no matter what car, what brand, if you're dealing with rubber bushings, always torque with the car on the ground. Now we can unbolt the sway bar. Not great, but not too bad. And on the other side, the boot is torn. Pay attention, there's L stamped on the sway bar link, as in left. So the torque spec is 20 millimeters and then 90 degree angle. Never seen that on a sway bar link before, but that's what the repair manual says, and that's what shall we do. <laughs> now we're going to do the sway bar bushings. And this car has dynamic drive, which means active sway bar. Pretty cool stuff. Bracket removed, and now I can remove the bushing. This is a bearing. Oh, it doesn't feel too bad. The repair manual says to keep everything oil and grease free. Clean the bracket as well. Some new bushing. And that's the left side done. This control arm was replaced by someone and it looks good. The bushing is good here. The ball joint is good. The tie rods, they have no place. So I'm gonna leave that be as well. And now we're gonna copy paste on the other side. So we're gonna replace the zip tie here with a proper clamp. And we did check the steering rack. It didn't have any leaks. And it doesn't. Residual stuff that drips from above. Give it a little bit more grease there. It's nice and firmly in place. All right, reinstall both of the caps that were missing here in the brake calipers. And that's this side done as well. We'll torque the front bushings later. Now we're gonna do the rear control arms. So I just checked, in order to replace the rear sway bar bushings, you need to drop the entire subframe. So we're not gonna do that. The bushings don't even look that bad. So there you have it, Alpina springs are actually Eibach springs. So this is the guide link, also used for alignment. So we need to mark that bolt over there. The ball joint is completely shot. The rubber is just gone. And then this one here as well. So let's first start with the bigger one. Oh. <clears throat> I need to unclip the wiring here. 
Now you're going to undo the ball joint. I'm spinning the ball joint, which you shouldn't do if you're using said ball joint, but you're replacing the whole thing. And this is faster. Now the bolt should come out easily. And it sure does. So that's one control arm out. And this ball joint had a ton of play. Here is a new one. I also transferred the plastic bracket. And now we can install it. So now we're gonna hold the ball joint, stop it from spinning, and slowly do up the nut. 165. And for the bushing side, finger tight and final torque with the car on the ground. So this here is an eccentric millionaire, eccentric bolt used for alignment. So we're going to clean it and mark its position so we can put it back exactly where it was. The car is going to get alignment regardless, but we need to get it back to where it was. Otherwise it's going to drive all over the place and you won't be able to drive it to the alignment shop, let alone the test drive. Don't forget about the washer. Nice and shot. So I can use my chicken foot extension here and torque the ball joint to spec. Torqued. Now I'm gonna do the sway bar link. Oh boy. The rubber is starting to separate on this one. The locking clip is gone. So these wouldn't last long anyway. But these are beefy sway bar links. Good. That's this side done. The brakes are actually good, at least the disc. We just need to drive it and clean up the surface rust. The pads are low though. And if I measure the disc, so maximum thickness is 24 millimeters. This one is slightly below 24, 23 and a half, and minimum is 22.4. So the disc is good. And I'm gonna order some new pads and we're gonna install that in the next episode. Now we're gonna drive it back and forth for the suspension to settle and then torque the bushings. Let's hear that cold start again. So the thrust control arm bushings are torqued to 100 millimeters and then 90 degree angle. Unfortunately, a torque wrench can't fit in here you're always supposed to torque by the nut and nut is on this side and because of the sway bar and the subframe, there's no chance you can fit a torque wrench here. Not even my digital one. So I'm gonna go by hand and just get it as tight as I can. So nice and tight. Like that. That should do it. My angle torque wrench keeps giving me an error. Too much torque for it. So we gotta do that by hand. So now we're gonna do 90 degree angle plus minus 15. So something till end of the lift there. That should do it. Around 90. Perfect. So my digital torque wrench only goes up to 100. So I'm gonna try 95 and then I'll do one more twist by hand. That was 95. That should do it. Now the guide link 
we need to line up the bolt with our marks. <sighs> That's everything torqued. And we are done with the suspension. Now let's take this party outside. You can almost taste the power. Just want to drive it a little bit just to make sure there are no knocking sounds or anything unusual and that we can actually drive this car on the street. Yeah, suspension feels good. Project Chicago is clean. For the first time in my ownership, from afar it doesn't look too bad, but you come up close and since it's all nice and clean, let's talk about the exterior. Body, condition-wise, it's not too bad, no major damage, but from detailing perspective, it's horrible. It's like someone washed this car with rocks, there's scratches and swirls all over the place. I mean, look at that. The hood as well, it's horrible. And the paint, it's mostly original, minus the hood, and that needs to be wet sanded and polished because the finish is a bit orange peely. That rear door over there has been repainted. And I don't know if you can tell on the camera, but the finish is slightly off. And I think that's mainly due to the fact that that's old original paint and that's new. So with paint correction, hopefully that will match up. If not, it's going to drive me nuts. The rims in horrible state. I'm going to have them refinished. This mirror, it's aftermarket, which means it doesn't have the power folding function, the heating and electrochrome. But most importantly, this base should be glossy black like the rest of the trim. So I bought one in Poland. I'm waiting for that to come in a couple of days and hopefully it'll work out because it's from a right-hand drive car. Minor scratches everywhere. Most of that will come out because it's not too deep. Unfortunately, this one here is too deep and that's going to come out about 90%, so it's not going to be too bad. We need PDR. There's slight damage here. Hopefully it can be pulled out. Taillights, horrible state. We're going to replace that. This one is cracked, low on blinker fluid. The rear bumper, unfortunately, has Three massive dents here, here, and here. The rest of it, it's not in too bad of a shape, but I think I'm gonna have that repainted as well. This side, it's pretty much the same story as the other one. Needs PDR and paint correction, but it's all original paint. And look at this hood. Man, boys from Gion are gonna have their work cut out with this car. And it's a massive car. It's gonna take an insane amount of hours to polish it. Headlights, we're gonna replace that in the next episode. Oh, the front bumper was repainted as well, but you can't really tell that unless you taste it. The grills, we're gonna replace that in the next episode as well. And the front end does look cool with the Alpina lip over there, well, bumper. And you can see all of the coolers there and stuff. That looks pretty cool. Exterior just needs a good cleaning. The steering wheel, it's going to be refinished by Alpina. Back to original condition, 359 euro. I hate this steering wheel so much. It's the ugliest steering wheel the BMW ever made, but that's what this car originally came with. I'm still looking for a nice set of wood trim for the interior, and this pickup stock here needs to be replaced. But otherwise, nice interior. Let's talk about my hat for a minute. I mean tint. I think I already mentioned this, but I don't like tint. Unless it's some really light, subtle tint that actually improves the look of the car. I can be on board with that, but the whole gangsta, like I'm trying to hide something look, just doesn't work for me. I know this is very much a matter of personal taste, but with tint also comes functionality. So if you live in Las Vegas, Dubai, or Texas, where this car used to live, you need to have the tint, otherwise you and the interior are just gonna cook. But we're no longer in Texas, we're in Frankfurt, Germany. And here, with such tinted car, you look like a pimp. So it needs to go. Not to mention that in Germany, you're not allowed to have any sort of tint on the front windows. It's illegal. On the rear windows, you can have it, but I think you need some sort of approvals and certificates or whatever. I have none of that. Besides, there's electric shades all over the place, so we don't need it. Now we're gonna start the, the pimping process. Not looking forward to that. I've done it a couple of times in the past and it's always a pain, but let's see how it goes. Oh, and the hat. Bought that on my trip in South of France. Saint-Tropez. 12 European shillings. Turns out there is something cheap over there. So we're gonna hit it with some steam. Let's see what happens. Oh, that's hot.
Oh, I think this is gonna work. It's actually coming off nicely. It's not leaving glue residue behind. Like that. Not too bad. A little bit of adhesive stayed, but I think if I hit it with the steamer, yeah, it comes right off. So this is actually not going too bad. Again, I know it's a matter of personal taste, but this looks so much better to me. Looks really classy now. Now the main party piece, the rear window. I think I need to open that door as well there. Yes. It's officially dark, but all of the foil is removed. I can highly recommend using a good steam machine for removing the tint. Just heat it up real good and start pulling off. And even if some glue is left behind, just point at it like that, and then just wipe it off. It's easy as that. In the past, I used acetone and that does work but it's really messy and you have to be careful not to drip on any of the trim but this is water it just evaporates in the end job lovely done now you're gonna reassemble the rest of the engine bay there's a lot of trim that goes over there but before i forget we need to replace the supercharger belt this one is not looking very good and i bought a brand new one original alpina continental belt Looking good, Mr. Cutter. That's the belt installed. Now we have plastic covers, which I just cleaned. I can reassemble the entire engine, but let's struggle with the cover. Ah. This rubber gasket, this thing can go in. Cabin air filters going in, and the filters are pretty much brand new. And now the beauty cover, which cleaned up lovely. Finally, we can get rid of the stick. Brand new hood shocks. Wait a minute, Coco. Lovely. And that's the engine bay completely reassembled. Let's go underneath now. So this car came to me without the bottom engine cover, the under tray. And in my opinion, that's one of the most important things to have on this car. Because if you don't have it, the aerodynamics are going to suffer. 
It's also good for protection because when you're doing 300 kilometers per hour on the Autobahn, all of the rocks and dirt and stuff is just going to be hitting the bottom of the engine and that's not good. Thankfully and surprisingly, this wasn't that expensive. 150 euros from the dealer, just a piece of plastic. I also bought that lip that goes somewhere in the front. And then the transmission cover, we already have that. All right. Nice. So a bracket goes here. So this is Alpina transmission cover because we have cooling fins in the transmission. Alpina cut the hole in this cover. I think normal 745i or 750i has all of this covered. The bottom end is buttoned up as well. We have this lovely lip that's going to scrape everywhere, but it's some sort of rubber, so it should be fine. The engine cover, firmly in place. Transmission surrounding and all of the wires tucked in. So when we come back from our test drive, we're going to remove all of this and see how many thousands of leaks we have. But with that, we are ready to hit the Autobahn. Guten Tag! It's test drive time. starts lovely. So I checked the tire pressure. It was low because the car was sitting forever. Checked all of the bodily fluids. We're good there. And we're off. 128,369 miles. So I'm hoping to do around 100 kilometers or so, so 60 miles. We'll see how it goes. First stop, go-go juice. Ride comfort. 21 inch tires and I gotta have much of that we're gonna go for 102 be right back so got some fisherman go go juice it says service minus 40 miles oh no it's a dog over there he likes the alpina I think so this is a particularly bad road let's see suspension too bad definitely softer than the e60 m5 but you know what i'm most likely gonna end up replacing shocks on this car as well you saw how worn they were on the e60 mm, yeah and the thing that i like about the e60 m5 now is it literally drives like a brand new car the suspension the engine everything it just feels like a brand new car and i love that about it and I want the same for this car. So I have to check the price and we're most likely gonna go with the original and I want it to feel like it did back in the day. And this is literally the first time I'm driving this car on the road. Ooh. Yeah, we're gonna need shocks. Or maybe it's just the big wheels. I'm not used to it, 21 inch. I've never had a car with such big wheels. You know, you gotta get that pimp experience somehow. We have no AC and the blower fan is not working. Something is broken there. <laughs> the power, it's there. I barely touch the throttle and it pulls. And see, when it, in the E60 M5, when it hit potholes and stuff, it just absorbs them so nicely. And the acoustic and everything, you can't even hear it in the car. It's just a nice thud. And here it's a bit crashy. Don't like it. Yeah, it should be absorbing these bumps a lot better in my mind. That's 80 according to Speedo, 76 over there. So, correct. Really comfortable seat. Same seats as in the E60 M5 and they're just the most glorious seats ever. So, so comfortable. So we're gonna keep it around 4,000 RPM. First time on the Autobahn, 150, comfortable cruising this is so far. That mirror is pissing me off already. It's an aftermarket mirror, as already said, and it's shaking pretty violently. All right, we've done five miles so far, so it survived five kilometers. Feels stable. It's 
steering wheel is not shaking it's semi straight not exactly straight but it needs wheel alignment i mean i like it so i'm only doing like a little bit of throttle but the wind noise it's I would expect it to be quieter than the E60. Maybe again the sunroof. Oh yeah. I hate sunroofs. Listen to that. Stupid sunroof. So I will replace the seal, but on the E60 M5, when I replaced the seal, it helped a little bit, but you can still hear it. And that's kind of inevitable with, uh, with the sunroof. For example, my E39 M5, that's a slick top, less wind noise than the E60. When you're driving 240 or whatever. You know, the normal speeds. Coolant temp is at 92 degrees Celsius, which is lovely. Our custom thermostat from Yarax is working perfectly. Ah, it's a shame I can't do a kick down. This thing would probably fly. But you know what? Nothing is rattling inside. It's a really quiet ride small buzz from something here stop it the turn signal stock on the 60 and the 65 is actually not too bad once you get used to it the only gripe that i have with it when you're driving really fast on the autobahn and you don't have time to look down to see if the turn signal is actually on or off and this doesn't really give you that good precise feel to know if it's on and off i don't know what it is on the newer bmws but that's the big flaw if you live on the other one because you can't you don't really have time to look down when you're driving 300 kilometers per hour you know what i mean i think we're gonna take some b roads now <laughs> 25 miles in so far so good <laughs> oh it pulls uh, I can't wait to fully break in this thing. Can we overtake this Peugeot? Sure we can. So go down to 30. Because these small towns and stuff, they love to put cameras on every corner. Transmission works. I think I was here with the E46 when I went on a test drive for the first time. Ooh, Jeremy Clarkson. Well, hello there, fella. I mean, the suspension, it's, it's not too bad. It's not like horribly bad. It's just, I would expect it to absorb bumps a lot smoother and nicer, but I think my expectations might be wrong because it's 21 inch wheels and sporty suspension tuned by the Alpina. Paired with high box springs, See what I mean? It should absorb that nicely. That was harsh. I don't like harsh ride. Tiny bridge. Corner. This thing is stable. Wow. Actually really impressed. Really impressed. You know, I was thinking about selling this car once it's fully done, but I don't know. I'm starting to like it. gonna pull over here I just want to hear the engine all right let's see what the engine sounds like handbrake does that work yes oh it's quiet it's really quiet The mighty Alpina B7 is alive. She's been in Texas, then Chicago, and now in beautiful German countryside. It's a beautiful day. 
something is buzzing here and it's driving me nuts. What is it? Stop it! It's absolutely driving me nuts, whatever that is. Beautiful road. It's unbelievable how such a heavy car handles so well. We are 47 miles in. So we don't want to be too gentle on this engine either. You got to get used to it, to revving and driving fast on the Autobahn. I mean, look at these roads. Oh, I'm thoroughly enjoying this ride. Oh, used car a lot. Think interesting, E39, Ooh, E38, like quad exhaust. Is that a camera? Of course it is. Rocket. Beautiful day, beautiful day. Beautiful weather, beautiful scenery, beautiful, good working car. We've covered 61.7 miles so far. So around 100 kilometers and it still works. Overtaking is a breeze. Back on the Autobahn. We're gonna slowly start heading back. We covered 70 miles. We have a knock. <sighs> this is not good. Oh, shit. we are knocking. Excuse me. Yeah. Hi, are you threatening? Yes, I am. Uh, I watch every video from you. Thank you. Ah. Okay. Thanks uh, for watching the videos. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I wish you very uh, luck. With, Thank with you. Car. Thank uh, you. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. Bye. So unfortunately, the nooms are very grim. Something is not happening in the engine. Sounds like like chain, to be honest. When you give it gas, or rod knock. Either way, I can't drive it anymore. So much for the test drive.
Guess I'm gonna call a tow truck now. Spawn bearing? Could be. Could where will be. How's oil? And it looks clean. So that went really well. Really did. Oil level is perfect, coolant is good. So when I pulled over earlier to take pictures, nothing was knocking. But now on the the autobahn it started to knock. And on that massive disappointment, we're gonna end the video here. I gotta wait for a tow truck. I'm about 50 kilometers away from the workshop. Then we're gonna put it on the lift and see what's going on. on my guess, it's not, not looking good. As always, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.